recall that a callable bound is a bound that gives the issuer right to call back the bound before the bound matures. So if it happens, then the investors cannot hold the bond to maturity. And that's why we need to calculate the so-called yield to call. So for example, if we have a 10-year 10% semi-annual coupon bond with $1,000 par value, and is currently selling for 1135.90 and 9% yield to maturity. So that is if you can hold the bond for 10 years till maturity but it can be called after five years at a call price of 1050. So what is it yield to call? Uh, we can calculate the yield to call the same way as the yield to maturity. So with the help of the financial calculator, we have coupon payment $50, and uh, we have 10 SM because that's, that's five years, or say 10 coupon payments. So this is if the bond is called back in five years. So within the five years, 10 payments, each payment being $50. And when the bond is called back, the company or say the issuer pays a call price of 1050. So F we here is not the $1,000 par value. And the price is 1135.9 in the negative number. And we compute for the IY and it turns out to be 3.765. And notice this is for six months because this is a semi-annual coupon bond. So for the whole year, the yield to call is 3.765% multiplied by two, so that is 7.53%. And notice this number is lower than the 8% yield to maturity. That means if the company, if the issuer decides to call back the bond, then the investors the bondholders cannot realize the yield to maturity. Instead, they would only realize the yield to call. So if you are an investor and you bought the bond, would you be more likely to earn the yield to maturity or yield to call? For this bond, notice that the coupon rate is 10%. Yield to call is 7.53%. The 7.53% yield to call suggests that the company could raise money by selling new bonds which pay 7.53%, a lower interest rate. Therefore, the company is likely to call the bonds and replace them with new bonds that pays only $75.30 a year, therefore reduce their interest expense. And this also means that investors should expect a call and expect that they can only earn the yield to call 7.5% for 5 years, not the yield to maturity, which is 8% per year for 10 years. In general, if a bond sells at a premium, then the coupon interest rate is greater than the market interest rate, so a call is likely. And investors should expect to earn a year to call on premium bonds and a year to maturity on bonds that are traded at par or at discount. So far we have talked about the fact that bond price or bond value is negatively affected by the market interest rate. Higher interest rate, low price, and lower market interest rate, higher bond price. So what determines the market interest rate? Here we say that the interest rate that a borrower needs to pay is determined by these five factors. They are R star, the real risk-free rate, IP, the inflation premium, DRP, the default risk premium, LP, liquidity premium, and MRP, the maturity risk premium. So let's explain one by one. The risk-free rate represents the interest rate an investor would expect from an absolutely risk-free investment over a specified period of time. The real risk-free rate R star is the minimum return an investor requires. It does not take into account expected infl inflation. The nominal risk-free rate is simply the real risk-free rate adjusted for inflation. So we say the nominal risk-free rate equals to 1 plus the real risk-free rate multiplied by 1 plus the inflation premium and the minus 1, and approximately it equals to R star, the real risk-free rate plus the inflation premium. The nominal risk-free rate can be measured by the yield on Treasury securities. So if you click on this link, we can go find the five-year Treasury bond yield.
For example, the five-year Treasury bond yield as of today is around 1.48%. Uh, so this is, again, the uh, Treasury bond yield. And if you click on this link, you can find the yield on Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, and we use that yield to measure the real risk-free rate. So five-year TIPS rate is about 0 0.37. This is lower than the Treasury bond five-year Treasury bond yield. So the difference between the yield on the five-year Treasury bond and the five-year TIPS bond would indicate the expected annual inflation for the next five years, and that is the so-called inflation premium. A bond spread is the difference between a corporate bond yield and a treasury securities yield of the same maturity. Generally, this difference is caused by the default risk premium and liquidity premium that applies to corporate bonds. Remember we say treasury bonds are considered the safest investment and therefore risk-free, and their treasury bonds usually do not have liquidity problems, so liquidity premium for them is also zero. But for a corporate bond, because of the default risk, and uh, lower liquidity compared to treasury bonds, uh, we assign default risk premium to a corporate bond and the liquidity premium to a corporate bond. So the difference between, uh, so for example, the difference between a five-year corporate bond and a five-year treasury bond, the spread is because of the default risk premium and liquidity premium for the five-year corporate bond. If you look at the green curve here, this is the yield of AT&T bonds of different maturity. And as you know, AT&T bonds, they are corporate bonds. And the blue curve here, this is the yield of treasury bonds of different maturities. So for example, when you look at 15-year bonds here, this is the yield for a 15-year AT&T bond, and this is the yield of a 15-year treasury bond. And uh, the difference is called the spread here. Liquidity premium is a premium that investors will require when bonds cannot be easily converted into cash at the fair market value. Bonds of large, strong companies usually have very small liquidity premiums, but bonds of small companies usually have liquidity premiums as high as 2%. Default risk premium is the additional return or premium that investors would require to compensate them for taking additional default risk. Standard measurement to tools to gauge default risk include credit ratings for bonds. Credit ratings for debt issues are provided by rating agencies such as Standard & Poor, Moody's, and Fitch ratings. Remember, at the beginning of this chapter, we look at the information for that bond issued by AT&T, and the Fitch rating for that bond is A. So that is the credit rating issued by Fitch Ratings that tells you the AT&T bond is fairly safe. Uh, bottom line is that the lower liquidity a bond has or higher default risk it has, the higher premium will be charged by investors and the higher interest rate the issuer needs to pay. So this is a list of the factors that could affect default risk and bond ratings. Uh, they include financial ratios, so you can imagine higher debt ratio, then maybe um, higher risk, therefore lower rating. Provisions in the bond contract. So for example, if the bond is unsecured, then it's considered to have higher risk and therefore lower ratings. And uh, other factors, for example, the company's earning stability and um, uh, potential product liability. They affect the company's uh, profit and um, earnings. So these factors affect the issuer's ability to pay back the debt in the future. Therefore, they affect the issuer's default risk and bond ratings. Maturity risk premium is a premium investors would require to hold bonds with longer maturities. And this premium exists because bonds with longer maturity have the higher interest rate risk. So what is the interest rate risk? For example, Assume that there are two bonds. Both have 10% coupon, but one has one year maturity and the other has 10 year maturity. 
Now, if the interest rate rises from 10% to 15%, how would the price of each bond change? What if the interest rate drops from 10% to 5%? You can calculate the price of each bond under each different interest rate and find out. And so, um, I put the readout in this table and uh, for the one year bond, when the interest rate is 10%, which is the same as a coupon interest rate, this bond is traded at par. When the interest rate goes up to 5%, bond price drops, and uh, for this one year bond, the price dropped to 957. So this is a negative 4.3% change. And when the interest rate goes down to 5%, bond price actually will rise, and it rise to 1048, so that is a 4.8% change for this one year bond. However, when you look at a 10 year bond, again, when the interest rate is 10%, this bond is traded at par because it's the same as the coupon interest rate. However, when the interest rate goes up to 15%, the bond price changes to 749, and that is a 35% drop. Now, if the interest rate goes down to 5%, the price goes up, and it goes up by 38%. So if you compare the 1-year bond and the 10-year bond, you realize the price of the 10-year bond reacts to the change of interest rate more dramatically. So it is clear from the calculations that the 10-year bond experiences more volatile price changes than interest rate changes, and we call this higher interest rate risk. Bonds are also subject to the reinvestment rate risk. Cash flows from the bond will have to be reinvested in the future at lower rate, reducing income. So suppose you just won $500,000 playing the lottery. You will invest the money and live off the interest. You buy a one-year bond with a year to maturity of 10%. In year one, your income is $50,000, which is 10% of your investment. At year end, the bond matures and you get back all the $500,000 to reinvest. If interest rate falls to 3%, then the income will drop from $50,000 to $15,000. However, had you bought a 30-year bond, income will have remained constant. Therefore, if interest rate drops, short-term bonds have lower interest rate risk, but they can be more prone to the reinvestment rate risk because of the fact that you will have to take your investment back and reinvest the money. So, to summarize, for the long-term bonds, they have high interest rate risk, but low reinvestment risk. For the short-term bonds, they have low interest rate risk, but high reinvestment rate risk, and nothing is riskless. Generally, yields on long-term bonds are greater than short-term bonds, so the MRP is more affected by interest rate risk than by reinvestment rate risk. Bottom line is longer term bonds will have a higher maturity risk premium. So as a summary, after introducing bonds, we apply the time value of money concept and techniques that we have learned in lesson 4 in bond valuation. So bond value essentially is the present value of annuity and uh, we can use different approaches to get the results. We can use the formula, we can use the financial calculator, or we can use Excel. Annual return from the bond is called yield to maturity, and yield to maturity has two components, current yield and capital gain yield. For callable bonds, investors may only earn yield to call if the bond is called, not yield to maturity. Different bond issues are subject to different interest rates. The market interest rate are determined by factors such as risk-free rate, inflation premium, liquidity premium, default risk premium, and maturity risk premium. Now we have finished our discussion about bond and bond valuation. Let's move on to stock and stock valuation. For common stocks, first we need to understand that stock ownership represents ownership of the company, and ownership implies control. Stockholders, they can elect directors who hire the management to manage the company. Since managers are agents of the shareholders, their goal is to maximize the stock price or say the value of the company. But you should also be aware of the agency problem that we discussed in Chapter 1. Speaking of valuing common stock, 
We will try different approaches. In this lesson, we'll cover the so-called dividend growth model, including constant dividend growth model and non-constant dividend growth. And uh, there's also free cash flow model that will be addressed in later lesson. We'll also discuss the use of multiples of comparable companies to value a company's stock. Using the dividend discount model, our stock value is the total present value of future dividends discounted at a required rate of return. If we use this P0 as the stock price at time 0, or say today, the price should be total present value of all the future dividends discounted by the RS, required rate of return, for the stock. This is conceptually correct. But how can you find the present value of an infinite stream? Because dividends are supposed to be paid indefinitely. So we need to make this solvable. To solve this, we need to make assumptions. If we assume that dividends are growing at a constant growth rate G, then, for example, next year, dividend D1 is current dividend multiplied by 1 plus G. And two years later, D2 will be current dividend compounded by the G for two years. And at any time t, dt will be dividend, current dividend d0, compounding by the growth rate for t years. So this is a compounding we've done in lecture 4. Then, the price equation that we saw from this page, this slide, can be rewritten as p0 equals to d1, which is d0, multiplied by 1 plus g at the power 1, discount by rs. And then D2, which is D0 multiplied by 1 plus G square, and discounted by RS um, for two years, and so far so forth. Now, if G is constant and less than RS, the required rate of return of stocks, then this long formula actually can be simplified as P0 equals to D0 multiplied by 1 plus g, and then divided by rs minus g. And this is called the constant dividend growth model, or the golden growth model. Since d0 multiplied by 1 plus g is d1, we can also say p0 equals to d1 divided by I, rs minus g. For that equation to work, we need g, the growth rate, to be reasonable, and it has to be lower than the required rate of return. What happens if g is greater than the required rate of, of return? If G growth rate of dividend is higher than the required rate of return, then actually the price can go to infinity. So the growth rate must be less than the required rate of return for the constant growth model to be applicable. Now we'll have a simple example. Estimate the intrinsic stock value based on the following information. If D0, the current dividend is $2 per share, Required rate of return is 13% and gross rate of dividend is 6%. Then price is estimated to be D0 multiplied by 1 plus G and then divided by RS minus G. You plug in all these numbers into this equation and uh, it should be 30.29. What about the price one year later? We use P1 for the price one year later and uh, for P1 we just use D2 in the numerator and similarly divided by rs minus g. P1 will be d2 which is 2.2427 divided by rs minus g and it will be 32.1. In general, price at any time t, we call it the pt, equals to the dividend one year later, so we use t plus 1 for one year after year t, and the dividend of year t plus 1 divided by rs minus g will give us the price at any time t. What if g is 0? When g is 0, then all dividends have the same amount. Then we can simplify the formula into p0 equals to d1 divided by rs minus g, and since dividends all have the same amount, we'll just use d divided by rs. This formula can also be applied to the valuation of preferred stocks which is a hybrid security. A preferred stock is similar to bonds in that preferred stockholders receive a fixed amount of dividends, which must be paid before dividends can be paid to common stockholders. However, unlike bonds, preferred stock dividends can be omitted without fear of pushing the company into 
bankruptcy. Again, for preferred stocks, the preferred dividend are assumed to be the same amount all the time. That's why we can use this formula uh, to find out the value of a preferred stock. Let's look at an example for the preferred stock valuation. If the preferred dividend is 2.1 per share per year, and the required rate of return by the preferred stockholder is 7%, then we just use 2.1 divided by 7%, and $30 is the fair market value for the preferred stock. We use dividend yield to measure how much cash flow you are getting for each dollar invested in the stock. So dividend yield equals to dividend divided by the price. If next year the dividend is going to be 2.12 and the price is 30.29, then the dividend yield is 7%. If next year we can sell the stock at a price P1, then we are realizing a capital gain of P1 minus P0. And uh, use this dollar amount of capital gain divided by the current price we are getting a capital gain yield. So after the calculation, capital gain yield tends to be 6%. And uh, you notice here that for stocks with constant dividend growth, the capital gain yield is the same as the growth rate of the dividend. Now, we'll, if we put the dividend yield and capital gain yield together, 7% plus 6%, we have a total return of 13%. That is the total return for stockholders. So why are stock prices so volatile in the market? If you look at this formula, you realize that if we change our assumption of the required rate of return or the growth rate, then we can get a combination of different results. So from this table, you can see any small change in growth rate or the required rate of return can cause large changes in the estimated price. That's what we observe in the stock market. As new information arrives, investors continually update the estimate of the growth rate and the required rate of return, then stock prices change accordingly.